Until today, pulmonary hypertension remains one of those conditions that is frequently missed by physicians and yet can have a high mortality. So stick around to learn a little bit about this high yield topic called pulmonary hypertension. When you have high blood pressure in general, that creates such a high resistance within the blood vessels of these patients. And that high resistance will lead to a limited blood flow to some important organs. Now think about patients with uncontrolled hypertension in general. They have a higher risk of developing a heart attack because the blood flow to the heart will be limited. They also have a higher risk of developing a stroke because the blood flow to the brain is also limited. And same thing when it comes to the kidney. Um, and really the same concept applies here when it comes to pulmonary hypertension. You have that high resistance within the pulmonary vasculature that limits the blood flow to the lung. And not surprisingly, a lot of the patients with pulmonary hypertension, their presenting symptom will be exertional dyspnea. The reason behind that is that when you're resting, your lung don't need a lot of blood flow in order for you to breathe. But when you are exercising, when the demand goes up, the, your body, due to the pulmonary hypertension, will have high, higher, higher, harder time trying to keep up with such a higher demand. And thus, when you exercise and you have that pulmonary hypertension, you will develop dyspnea. Other symptoms include dizziness, syncope, chest pain, and if pulmonary hypertension remains untreated, patients will eventually develop right side heart failure. Why right side heart failure? Let's take a look at the circuit of blood coming from the left ventricle and ending in the right ventricle. So the oxygenated blood will be carried by the left ventricle, as you know, will be pumped through the aorta to the rest of the organs to utilize the oxygen. And once the oxygen is utilized, the deoxygenated blood will come back to the right ventricle through the superior and inferior vena cava, and the right ventricle would then pump that blood to the uh, pulmonary vasculature and to the lung through the pulmonary artery. The issue here is within the pulmonary vasculature itself, you have such a high resistance there, such that the right ventricle will have harder time pumping blood to the lung with time the right ventricle will eventually fail and the blood will back up from the right ventricle to the rest of the body. And that's when you develop symptoms of right-sided heart failure. And when you examine these patients, you'll see peripheral edema, you'll see JVD, you'll see some hepatic congestion. Also, when you examine these patients, you'll, you'll see persistently split S2. The reason is, is because your pulmonary valve will have such a delay in its closure due to the high pressure. You'll see tricuspid regurgitation, you'll see right ventricular heave, along with, of course, the signs of the right-sided heart failure. Now, once you uh, get a patient with such signs and symptoms and you suspect pulmonary hypertension, you have to remember that the first test you always order is transthoracic echo. And because it's an easy uh, test to get and it's very cheap, through the transthoracic echo, you'll get a picture of what the right ventricle looks like, if there is a right heart strain or not. You'll also get this number, which is the right ventricular systolic pressure. If that is elevated, um, ele by elevated I mean if it's above 40, that should increase your suspicion that the patient have pulmonary hypertension. And I said increase this, your suspicion, but I didn't say firmly say that the patient has pulmonary hypertension. Why I said that is because the gold standard to diagnose pulmonary hypertension is a right heart cath. You will never be able for your board exam to confirm this diagnosis until you get the right heart cath. And through the right heart cath, you're going to get a number called mean pulmonary arterial pressure. And if that number if, is 20 or above, then you establish the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension and that's what the definition is for this condition. Now, the older guideline used to say pulmonary hypertension is 25 or above, but uh, latest studies, um, they, they investigated in that and by reducing the cutoff to 20, they were able to detect more and more cases of pulmonary hypertension, especially in its milder form. 
Now, once you establish the diagnosis, you want to think about what is the cause. And through the cause, you want to classify it from class 1 to class 5. And that's the next segment of this video. Let's first talk about class 1. And in class 1, the source of the hypertension is within the pulmonary arterioles themselves. And not surprisingly, is if the source is within the vessels, I would classify that as class 1, and I would call it pulmonary arterial hypertension. If I would take a cross-section of this pulmonary arteriole, it would look something like this. You will have an innermost layer, which is called endothelial layers. Surrounding that, you have smooth muscles layer. And in normal patients, the endothelial layer, depending on this, the state of the body, will secrete certain chemicals to the smooth muscle to allow it to vasoconstrict or dilate. These chemicals, some of them are vasoconstrictors, such as endothelin. Some of them are vasodilators, such as nitric oxide, that will then lead to an increased level of cyclic GMP. Or prostacyclin, that will lead to an increased level of cyclic AMP. And both of those are vasodilators. In patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, there is a disruption there, such that you'll have more vasoconstrictors being formed by the endothelial layers, and less vasodilators and in that situation your vessels will always be constricted and imagine that in both lung fields and throughout the entire respiratory system that over time will lead to significant elevation in the pulmonary pressure and leads to pulmonary hypertension and that's what we see in class one what causes that a lot of time it's idiopathic but we know that there are some conditions that predisposes the patients to um, developing the, this class, such as HIV, connective tissue disease, portal hypertension, schistomiasis, and certain drugs such as cocaine and amphetamine. So knowing this pathogenesis, you will be able to easily understand what the treatment for this class is. And how would we reduce this constriction? How would we allow the vessels to dilate? Is by giving uh, an antagonist to the vasoconstrictors, such as endothelin antagonist. An example of that is bosentan. Other options is to give something that will increase the cyclic GMP level, such as phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and sildenafil is an example of that. Or to give an agonist, prostacyclin agonist, to increase the level of cyclic AMP, such as apoprostenol. Any of these three classes of medications, or any of those um, can be given for this class of pulmonary hypertension. They are all FDA approved. Another FDA approved medication is uh, Rio Sigwat, but that is a second line agent to these three classes of medication. Before you give any of these medications, just another point is you want to do something called nitric oxide hypersensitivity test. And if patients are positive for this test, then you would know that they can benefit also from calcium channel blockers such as nifedipine. This is just an additional point for, for just for you to remember for your boards. Moving on from class one, talking about the other classes. Class 2 is if you have an issue with the left heart. Basically, if you have a left heart disease, such as heart failure, then the blood will back up from the left ventricle into the lung and leads to significant pulmonary congestion. Over time, this congestion will lead to an increase in the pressure and thus class 2 pulmonary hypertension. The way I like to remember it is that the heart has two ventricles, so I would classify that as class 2. The third class is if you have hypoxic lung disease. Now remember that the lung's normal response to any hypoxia it would vasoconstrict to allow for shunting of the blood to more areas of the, of the lung that has better oxygenation. Now, if you have a condition uh, that such as COPD, IPF, um, ILD, then that the hypoxia would be throughout both lungs and over a long period of time those vessels will remain constricted and eventually will lead to pulmonary hypertension. 
How do I remember that it's class three? Remember, class three, you have a problem with the respiratory tree. Class three, a problem with the respiratory tree. Moving on to class four. Now, class four is that if you have a pulmonary embolism, if you have a clot there sitting in your lung for a long period of time, eventually a pulmonary hypertension will develop. And the way I remember it is the word clot has four letters. So not surprising I would classify it as class four. They will ask you in the boards is that how would you diagnose this? You probably are gonna jump and say CT angio, but the answer here is actually VQ scan. In cases of CTEF or chronic thromboembolism pulmonary hypertension, the number one um, diagnostic imaging is VQ scan. It has been shown that it has a much higher sensitivity than CT angio. The last class is class five. Basically, if there is a condition that I did not know where to put it in from class one to class four, I would put it as class five. Under that falls sarcoidosis, chronic re renal disease, and the list goes on. You can look it up. Now, we kind of touched base on the treatment for class one, but what about the other classes? In class two, three, and five, you want to treat the underlying cause. And by treating the underlying cause, by treating the heart disease, by treating the lung condition, then you would, um, that will lead to an improvement in the pulmonary hypertension. In class four, if there is a clot there, you want to take care of it, you want to remove it by thromboendorectomy. The, you can also give a medication called Riosiguat, that is second-line agent, that is the only medication that's FDA approved for class four. And also, uh, for all the classes, if the patient is hypoxic, you want to give them oxygen, uh, you want to also involve them in an exercise program, and you want to do anticoagulation, but that is basically on a case-by-case -case, um, situation, and you want to weigh the benefit over risk for every patient's case. And last but not least, is that when you uh, encounter a patient with pulmonary hypertension, you want to give them an early referral to a specialized center in the management of pulmonary hypertension that has shown to make a significant impact when it comes to mortality reduction. So that is it for today's video. Just remember for your boards, the definition of pulmonary hypertension. Remember that the first image is to do a transthoracic echo, but the gold standard is a right heart cath. Remember how to uh, identify the signs and the symptoms, and remember mainly the treatment for class one, because they like to ask about um, the class one management as well. That is it. Hope everyone have a great day. Take care.